Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. God wants us to understand that there are certain types of spiritual gifts and how they work. And He's given us a couple chapters in a row here that deal with them. And we're going to deal today with uh, Pentecostalism and also the Charismatic Movement. Those are actually two separate things that fall under the same umbrella. And the title of my sermon tonight is called The Azusa Street Possession. The history it goes back to an event that they all look to and they well, that's when the revival started. And they say it was it was a revival. I say it was a demonic possession. And listen, there are two separations between Pentecostal and then Charismatic. And the two main doctrines we're going to deal with tonight are the lies they have about speaking in tongues, which biblically is just another language, but then also the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And this one's a little bit more complex. There are certain Christians that do not know how to answer this. And it says here that we should not be ignorant about the gifts. So we're going to look at how to answer this, what scriptures clearly define these things. So we know exactly what God meant when He said these things. So we're not you know, led astray as many of them are. Now, under the Pentecostal umbrella, you have the Apostolic Church of the Assemblies of God. You have the Church of God in Christ. You have the Church of God. You have the International Church of this Four Square Gospel. You have the International Pentecostal Holiness Church. If you've ever heard of a Holiness Pentecostal, these are the ones that they look conservative. They'll wear long skirts. They'll have the big beehive where they, they believe they should not cut their hair. A lot of the ladies do. Um, a lot of them are oneness. And then you also have the United Pentecostal Church international that's probably the most common breed that you'll see those are all pentecostals and they point back to acts 2 at the day of the pentecost and they say what happened there happened at azusa street which i'm going to read an article about that here in a second but also there is this catholic charismatic renewal that happened in 1967. the catholics said well look the pentecostals are building mega churches the very first mega church was this Amy Simpson, the Foursquare Gospel Church. Back in the early 1900s, she as a woman preacher was building a mega church. I mean, that's where it all the, the term mega church originated was dealing with this woman who was literally, she was a tongue talking devil. She had many different husbands and there's so many things wrong with her, but we're not really going to focus on her. We're going to look at where she got her doctrine from. Um, but the Catholics said, well, we got to get on board. How, I mean, they're making billions of dollars by the 60s. Like, what can we do? So they created the charismatic movement is what it's most commonly known as. It started as the Catholic charismatic renewal. The founder of that was a, a guy named William Story. And again, they point back to the Pentecostals. And the Pentecostal, it, the movement was started by a guy named Charles Fox Parham. And he was an American Pentecostal, it says, a pioneer and founder of the apostolic faith movement. Now, apostolic would imply the gifts that the apostles had. There was a revival in the 1900s. Well, why had the apostles' gifts expired? Why had no other religion been using the apostles' gifts for thousands of years? We're going to look at what the Bible says about that. But So that's what they started. And he's known as the father of the Pentecostal movement. He is the guy that they all point back to. And one of Parham's early disciples, disciples William J. Seymour, he was an African-American holiness preacher who was, he sat under Parham's instruction in Houston, Texas. Um, but, and then in 1906, Seymour was invited to lead a series of meetings in California. And it says, while preaching in a ramshackle building in Azusa Street at the edge of downtown Los Angeles, he began to teach some of the distinctive doctrines he had learned from Parham. He taught, for example, that the only biblical evidence of spirit baptism is the gift of speaking in tongues. Now this is where they begin to create a strange doctrine and a division. The Bible teaches everybody that's saved, that's born again, has God's Holy Spirit dwelling in them. There, there's a misunderstanding of what it means about the baptism. And it's used in different ways. We're going to look at all that. But so what they're going to do is take a few verses and change it. And they change the definition and say, well, how do we know that you're really saved? Well, we need to see you speak in tongues. And what they did, what they called tongues, was nothing like what happened at the day of Pentecost. So they're, well, basically they're, they're saying salvation evidence is to see somebody 
doing this gibberish, right? Do what you see the Pentecostals do today. Now what's interesting is that Charles Fox Parham, this father of the Pentecostal movement, was actually a faggot, okay? In the San Antonio Light, a newspaper, he made national news, and here was the headline. It reads, Evangelist is arrested, C.F. Parham, who has been a prominent in the meeting here. He was taken into custody. Report said Parham, about the age of 40, and a guy, J.J. Jordan, 22, had been charged with committing an unnatural offense sodomy it was a felony under texas statute 524 hey back in the day when it was a felony to be a sodomite to be a pervert you know and, and they and look what they, they locked them up they hey some of them back in the old times they used to put them to death under god's law we should be putting them to death but we don't live in those times now uh boy it'd be a better day if we did but so here you have this guy who i believe was possessed with a devil i believe he was a reprobate false prophet right he's the father of the pentecostal movement and he's a pervert, he's a faggot, he's a molester, he's, a, he's, he's caught with a younger man. Now, on the Assembly of God website, I want to read you this article of William J. Seymour and this Azuzu Street pen, the possession, right? This was written by a guy named Gary B. McGee. It says, to read the newspapers in 1906, one might have wondered about all the excitement in an old building on Azuzu Street in the industrial part of the city. According to the Los Angeles Times, a bizarre new religious sect had started with people breathing strange utterances and mouthing a creed which would seem no sane mortal could understand. In other words, they're saying things nobody could understand. They're uttering things that no one can understand. And utter means speaking. So the, the two words sort of contradict, but he said, it goes on, he says, furthermore, devotees of the weird doctrine practice the most fanatical rites, preaching the wildest theories and work themselves into a state of mad excitement. So what it is, it's a bunch of emotionalism, just as the Pentecostals are today. Woo! Right? They're trying to get a spiritual high. Like, boy, you sure are spiritual today, brother. No, you're just emotional, right? And listen, do not confuse the two because that is what ha is happening in most churches. Well, I didn't really feel anything. Why? Because somebody wasn't jumping up and down and shouting and hooraying. Hey, preaching is for understanding. Yeah. The Word of God is something that has to be understood. Right. And the Bible has to be clearly understood. Otherwise, you're not even having church. He goes on, he says, if that didn't grab the reader's attention, the article continued by saying uh, say that at night it was made a hideous in the neighborhood by the howlings of the worshipers who spend hours swaying forth and back in a nerve-wracking attitude of prayer and supplication. Howling. Howling. Let me tell you something. If your church sounds like howling, then you got a problem. It's not a church. Yeah, right. It's not a biblical church. That is not a biblical doctrine. You show me one verse where you see a sane Christian howling like a dog, barking like a dog, rolling around and making these noises. Hey, I can show you in the Old Testament where it's clear that somebody's possessed with the devil and they do those things. Yeah. He goes on, he says, to top it all off, they claim to have received the gift of tongues and what's more, comprehended the babble. Babble is not something you can understand, no. right? Babies babble and you're like, I wonder what they're saying. Yeah. Right? And that's what they're saying. Oh, they're, they're making noises nobody understands. It must be of God. No, it was a false prophet filled with a devil, not God's Holy Spirit. And they will, Pentecostals and Charismatics will attack you if you question their gift of the tongues. They will say, well, you're blaspheming the Holy Spirit, but the Bible is clear about that. That blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is when you say that Jesus did miracles by the power of the devil. That is blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, and that is an unforgivable sin. And listen, it's not that the sin itself is unforgivable, it's just showing you the evidence of the heart of a reprobate, of somebody that is unsavable, somebody that hates God and hates the Holy Spirit. And so now, you know, I have a picture here of the original newspaper clipping, and it says, The weird babble of tongues, new sect of fanatics is breaking loose. Wild scene last night on Azuzu Street, right? And listen to the final statement they make here. This is the headline. Gurgle of wordless talk by a sister. The women are preaching in the church, and what are they saying? 
Man, that's not of God. Look, this is some wicked, strange doctrine. And I want to help educate you tonight about the truth of it. And if you're listening, well, I think there might still be something for speaking in tongues, then you don't know what the Bible says about it. I'm going to show you how to defend it. I'm going to show you how to fight against it. And I'm going to encourage you to stand up against it. Somebody just came across somebody else soul winning who started, I mean, listen, Pentecostals are not saved. They believe you can lose your salvation. They're trusting in their emotional action of speaking in gurgle to prove that they're saved. And that's why they go back down to the altar and they have an emotional experience. They have four-hour church services and what, 15 minutes of preaching? It's all music. It's all this big emotional experience. Look, we read, you're in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Look at verse number 4. He says, Now there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. Right? God's Holy Spirit, the gifts that He gives us, there are different types of gifts, but it all comes from that one Holy Spirit. It comes from the same source. It shouldn't be so drastically different that you have this sect, this cult of the Pentecostals that are saying, well, what we have of the Holy Ghost. I had a guy just yesterday, I ran oh no, it's full, or full gospel. Full gospel, what, F-O-O-L? Right? And what he's saying, we, we, we don't just believe in the good news of being saved, we believe, believe if you are saved, then you will speak with strange utterances, this gargle of babble that no one can understand. Listen, that guy wasn't saved. He believes in a different gospel. When they say full gospel, they mean a foolish, man-made gospel that changes the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's the same spirit. It should be evident unto your spirit if you're saved. Now look at verse number 8 in this chapter. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom. To another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit. So he's, he's saying the people in the church are going to have different gifts. He tells us some people will have multiple gifts. Some may only have one, depending on how, how much they're responding to what God's showing them to do. Look at verse number 9. It says, To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, the gifts of healing by the same Spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy, which is preaching. To another, discerning of spirits. To another, diverse kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. We're going to stop right here for a second. So, diverse means different kinds of tongues. Tongues means languages. There are some people that speak other languages. I speak English, and I guess you could say I speak Pig Latin. I don't know if that counts as a, as a, English, as a language, right? Who in here speaks a second or a third language other than English? One, two, three, four. Right? Brother Alberto got to use his Spanish this morning to speak in tongues to a person that walked in the door that was unsaved. He was using the power of God's Spirit to preach the Gospel boldly and he did it in another language. That's exactly what happened in the Bible when we see speaking in tongues. I want you to turn to Acts chapter 2. Turn to Acts chapter 2. Keep in your place in 1 Corinthians 12. We will be back. Listen, your Pentecostals, your Charismatics, they are possessed with devils. They are false prophets. They do not believe in once saved, always saved. They do not believe in eternal security. They don't believe it's a free gift of salvation. And I mean, those things alone should be enough to say, well, wait a minute, there's a problem. Yeah. Right? right? But there are people on the internet where you, they will lump up with other Pentecostal. Hey, hey, how you doing, brother? No. Look, when I ran into the guy yesterday that said he's full gospel, I didn't call him brother. Right? I should have called him something else. I didn't, right? I, he's not a brother. He's not a Christian. He's not saved. He doesn't believe what the Bible, the Bible's record about salvation. He perverts it into what Amy Simpson wanted him to believe it is. And he doesn't probably doesn't even know who she is. You know, most people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. And Christians today, I have seen truly saved Christians that assume that the Pentecostals must be Christian. And then on the outside looking in, I have met unsaved people that say, well, if that's Christianity, what the Pentecostals are doing, well, I'm not sure I want to take part in that. Right? How is it a bunch of unsaved, uneducated, unchurched people can look at the Pentecostal movement and say, that's weird, that's wicked, but you have a bunch of foolish Christians that look at it and say, well, I don't know. I mean, they claim the name of Jesus. Maybe they really are Christians. Maybe there's something there I just don't understand. Listen, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge, and God would not have us to be ignorant concerning these spiritual gifts. Learn what they are. Learn biblically 
how it should uh, should appear and then you can know when you when you confront somebody you say hey well actually uh, does it apply does it look like this in fact look at Acts chapter 2 verse number one we're gonna look at exactly how tongues should be anybody that says I oh I, I have the gift of tongues you can say oh really does it look like this look at verse number one and when the day of Pentecost was fully come they were all with one accord in one place and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind and it filled all the house where they were sitting and there appeared listen appeared that's visible unto them cloven tongues like as of fire and it sat upon each of them so what happened the church is together they're praying all of a sudden they see a ball of fire shaped like a tongue that basically sits on each of these people that is miraculous that is a miracle from God that comes from on high it looks like they're on fire but they're not it's shaped in a tongue what are you gonna do it's like uh, you know bro there's a tongue on your head it's made of fire yeah I know it's God right now have you ever seen that today now I have seen false prophets who they'll get the microphone and you hear that mighty rushing wind oh we all felt something yeah it's called the sound system right that's not God that is deception what the Pentecostals do and they're trying to trick people and they're the ones that will literally pass buckets around asking for your money or could do it again oh just do it again you know and look look what he says in verse number four and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues I want you to underline if you underline in your Bible I want you to underline the word other 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 is a word that means it's a comparing word, right? So, it, you know, you can't just say any old noise. Well, that wouldn't fit, right? They spoke with one language, and all of a sudden they're speaking with another language, right. right? It wasn't just some mysterious language that nobody understood. That is not tongues according to the Bible. It is a discernible language meant for preaching the gospel that somebody could understand, that somebody could listen to and learn about the Word of God. Learn about Jesus Christ. So look, it says, other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. To utter is to make noise. That's to say something. So they're, they're talking and then all of a sudden they're speaking in another language. As if I began speaking in Spanish and our Spanish speakers just continue to understand it. That, that would be the miracle that's happening here. Look, he goes on. It says in verse number 5, And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men, out of every nation under heaven. Now, the Pentecost was the, 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 the seven times seven and then one. It's a 50. Penta means five, right? So every 50 years, they had this special feast. They had a seven year. And then at the end of 49 years was the year of Jubilee, the Liberty. And they were, they were all these people from all around the world were coming back for this 50th year feast. This is something that their forefathers had told them about. This is something that they were raised learning about. And even though they lived in other countries, they were coming back because they believed in God. They were God's people. So, and, hey, God said to do it, we're going to do it. Just as much as if somebody said, hey, well, you know, every 50 years, whether you're alive or your children are alive, we all have to go to New York City. I say, well, whatever God wants. I mean, New York, that's a filthy place. But if that's where God wants us to go and do something, we're going to do it, right? So it'd be, that'd be very similar. And look what he says. He says, of every nation, right? Verse 6, now when this was noised abroad, what was noised? The fact that there were men with fire on their head speaking in other languages. Look, the multitude came together and were confounded. I'd be confounded too. Like, whoa, what is going on here? I'd be curious. I'd want to know what was happening. It says, because that every man heard them speak in his own language. Right? Tongue equals language. Yeah. Every time you hear the word tongue in the Bible, I want you to think language when you read something and you say well wait a minute what does this mean and it says tongues I want you to just say the word language and help it'll help you understand what's actually happening look at verse 7 and they were all amazed and marveled saying one to another behold are not all these which speak Galileans and how hear we every man in our own tongue they're here in their own language wherein we were born Parthians Medes Elamites Dwellers in Mesopotamia, in Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, in the parts of Libya, about Cyrene, and strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes, 
Cretes and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. What was happening here? Men from all these different languages, it lists like 15, 16 places around the world, and it said they came from these places, they were here at the day of Pentecost, and all of a sudden God's disciples were speaking where they could understand it. Because you imagine, if every 50 years you had to go, you're going to have children that speak the native tongue. They speak that native language. That's what they were born in. If they were dwelling in there and they came back and then went back, and they had more children there. You think about it, these other countries, their native tongue is different than the, the, the religious the tongue or the tongue that was spoken there in Jerusalem at the time. So again, tongues is always something that's used to preach the gospel. Never do you see somebody in the Bible just stand up and just to show off. All right? But that's what the Pentecostals do. It's full, they're full of that spirit from the devil, which is pride. They want to deceive people. They want people to see, look how holy I am. And you think about it, if, you, if your, how, the, the strength of your spirit or your, your spiritual growth was evident by how much you got crazy on a Saturday night or a Sunday morning, you know, people would be doing some pretty stupid stuff. Yeah. Everybody down there knows I'm filled with it. They saw me jump that thing over. They saw me, whoa, you know what I mean? Think about it. So this... What, what's in the Bible is totally different than what the Pentecostal movement of today is because they're not preaching the Gospel. They don't know the Gospel. They're not even saved. And you know, this happened to fulfill prophecy. This was a promise that God said something would happen. It, it's, in the, it's in all of the Gospels. It's in the Old Testament. It's to bring in the New Covenant. It's to make evident that what Jesus had finished and what He had begun. Now I want you to look at verse 16. It says, but this is that which was spoken by Joel, by the prophet Joel, and it shall come to pass that in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens, I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. Right? What's happening? They're filled with God's Holy Spirit. They're speaking languages that other people thought they were the only ones that knew. And they were preaching the Gospel. People were getting saved. They're prophesying mightily. This was what was foretold of the day of Pentecost. Look at verse 21. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. What do you have to do to be saved? Just believe on the Lord. Call on the Lord. Genesis chapter 4 all the way to the end. Hey, it's always been just by believing. It's not by evidence of you being filled with the Spirit. It's not by evidence of you speaking in another language or in garble. Now, turn back to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. First Corinthians chapter 12. Find verse number 13. It says, For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body. So remember earlier he was saying that, that we all get different gifts, but it's all through that one Spirit, right? So he goes on, By one Spirit are we all baptized into one body. Whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have all been made to drink into one Spirit. Now listen, the, there are different baptisms in the Bible, right? Uh, Brother, Brother Dalton got baptized today. He was part of this church before he got baptized in water, right? He was already on his way to heaven before he got baptized in water. He was baptized into the Spirit, right? His soul is sealed unto the day of redemption. He is sealed by that Holy Spirit of promise. It will lead him and guide him in all truth. That is the promise that God gave. He, he's eternally secure. He can never lose that. Now, understanding that other times in the Bible it talks about being baptized in the Holy Spirit is dealing with God's Spirit falling upon a man and they speak. And we're going to get back to that, but I want you to see it here in context. Uh, we'll get back and we'll talk about more about that. Look at verse 14. He says, For the body is not one member, but many. Right? This church is not one person, but many. We're all here. We're all different. We have different administrations, different ministries, different gifts of God, and we all work together to act as one body, one unit. Flip ahead to verse number 28. Verse 28. And God hath set some in the church, first apostles. Now, are there any apostles left alive today? 
No, they're not. An apostle is somebody that was ordained of Jesus. They, they saw what happened. They saw His ministry. They saw Him dead. They saw Him resurrected. They, they saw these evidence. And Jesus said, you're my apostle. Anybody that claims to be an apostle is a liar. They're a liar. And I went to a private school one, one time years ago, and a, a friend there in the school were talking, and, okay, what did your dad do? Oh, he's an apostle. And I laughed. I laughed in her face. I was just like, okay. Now, what did he really do? And she was like offended. Like, no, he's an apostle. He goes around and I'm like, oh, oh, he's one of these. Woo! Like, she was serious, you know. Turns out she was nuts. Go figure, right? The whole family was probably possessed. <laughs> now, look, look at verse 28. It says, and God has set some in the church, firstly apostles, secondarily prophets. That's preachers. Prophesying means to preach. Thirdly, teachers. After that, miracles. Then gifts of healing. Helps. Governments, diversities of tongues. So of this list right here, the first was the apostle. The best you could get is an apostle. And guess what? The apostles died off. The apostles don't live forever. And not anybody, not just anybody can be an apostle. You can't take this title or the special power of the Holy Spirit that came with it. You can't just take that upon yourself. So that when he says secondarily prophets and then teachers, those are the things that those are the best gifts that we have in the church today. Look at the next. He says, Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers, are all workers of miracles, have all the gifts of healing, do all speak with tongues, do all interpret, right? He said, who, does everybody in here know a foreign language? Has everybody in here got up and preached on a men's preaching night? No, there's different gifts for different reasons. We're all brought together in different ways. Look at verse 31. He says, but covet earnestly the best gifts. And yet I show unto you a more excellent way. What is the more excellent way? We're going to get it into the next chapter where it's preaching the gospel in love. But what, what is the best gift? Hey, we're, we're warned about covetousness, right? But if there's one thing you would desire in life, what is it? The best gift. Well, what is the best gift that we can have today? To be a prophet of God. To be a man of God that preaches the Word of God. To be a lady of God that preaches the Gospel to people. That is the best thing you could hope for. That is the gift you should desire is to be used of God. That God's Spirit would fill you and you would boldly preach the Gospel to people. Amen. That is the best you can hope for. And look at the next verse there. It's 1 Corinthians 13, verse number 1. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity... I am become as a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. So he goes on to say, hey, covet the best gifts. I'm going to show you the more excellent way. We know the next chapter. It's all about love. He's saying, hey, love is more important than saying, yeah, but I speak five languages. So what if you're not loving about it? So what if you don't love the lost and you're going to go out and preach to those that, that can understand you? So what if you show off your language? Look at verse 8. Charity never faileth, but where there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. It shall vanish away. These things vanished away. The gifts of, of speaking with other language to a certain extent as the apostles have or had it, I believe, have gone away. Now listen, today there are people that are apt to learn languages. They are quickly able to learn languages and then able to preach the gospel in those languages. I believe that is God giving you the ability to learn a tongue and preach through that tongue. So is the gift entirely gone away? I don't think so. But is it the way it was here? No, obviously not. Can anybody say, oh yeah, just like that I knew Spanish? No, I don't think so. Because I don't know that this is a mental ascent where you can then verbally access all of the the, the, you know, the, the structure of a language, I believe it was just, hey, I'm just doing what I'm doing, which is preaching the gospel. And the Holy Spirit worked through the miracle of my talking and their hearing, and the Word of God was preached boldly. That's where the miracle was. And I don't know that we still have that anymore today. If God wanted to do it, could He do it? Yes. I'm not going to put God in a box. And, and when you say, well, I'm learning another language, and I believe that because I'm, I'm trying to learn it to preach the gospel, God has helped me learn it quickly. Is that part of a gift or a miracle? Sure. I don't see why not. I mean, God can bless you and help you do that. Look at verse number 9. He says, For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. Listen, certain things are done away with. 
Certain things are gone. The apostles are gone. They're not coming back. Well, they will at the resurrection, right? But you, you're not an apostle. You'll never have what they have. So to use what you have, use the gifts that God has given you and the ministry God has given you and do the best you can with it. Look at verse... Actually, go to the next chapter. Uh, chapter 14, verse number 1. He says, Follow after charity and desire spiritual gifts, but rather that ye may prophesy... So again, this is exactly how he ended chapter 12, where it lists all of the gifts. That's how he's, he's beginning chapter 14. He's saying, you know, where he said, covet earnestly the best gifts, and he told us that the prophets were the best. Then he starts in 14 and says, got to have love, but desire the best gifts, which are to be a preacher. Verse number two, for he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God. For no man understandeth him, howbeit in the Spirit he speaketh mysteries. So if somebody came in here and they started speaking Russian or a Slavic language or German, the majority of the people in here may not be able to discern what language it is. Some of you might say, no, I'm pretty sure that's German, but you still don't understand what he's actually saying. And this is what it's talking about here in the church. We're not going to have Brother Alberto get up here and preach in Spanish because most of us won't know what he's talking about. And if we don't know what he's talking about, then we are not edified as a church. We're not growing as a church. Look at verse 3. But he that prophesieth speaketh unto men to edification and to exhortation and to comfort. When you get up and preach in English and everybody in here understands in English, that's prophesying for edification. You're learning, you're understanding, you're growing by what you hear. Look at verse 5. I would that you all spake with tongues, but rather that you prophesied, for greater is he that prophesieth than he that speaketh with tongues, except he interpret that the church may receive edifying. So again, he's very clear here. I want you to preach. I want you to be able to preach the gospel. It's not just about having languages. What good does your language do you if you can't preach the gospel in it? If you all, brother, I speak five languages. Yeah, how many can you give the gospel in? Then, you know, think about it. That's what it's for. Verse 6, Now brethren, if I come unto you speaking with tongues, remember, when you see tongues, think languages. If I come unto you speaking with languages, what shall I profit you, except I shall speak to you either by revelation, or by knowledge, or by prophesying, or by doctrine? If there's no understanding, there is no profit. He says, if I speak a language you don't know, what profit does it do you? Zero. And the Pentecostals will base... They're, they're out of these chapters here, they try to base their doctrines out of it, but they clearly ignore some of the most important verses. They clearly ignore the fact that tongues is languages, and they do garbledygook. They do some, you know, a, ch a child's language. They're just making noises and acting like a fool because they're possessed with a devil. Look at verse 8. If the trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to battle? Hey, if the fire alarm goes off in here, and we don't know it's the fire alarm? Hey, they're standardized in America. You know, there's a law about how your fire alarm should look and act and sound, right? We have the PA system and everything in here, right? If it goes off, we're going to know it's the fire. Even if we've never heard one before, we're going to know. Yeah. What if it's just some beep? Is that the microwave? Beep. Should we run? Should we check it out? What is that, right? It has to be distinguishable. It's something that you know. The trumpet is to warn you. And in the same way, preaching was to warn the lost and to help them get saved. Look at verse 15. What is it then? I will pray with the Spirit and I will pray with the understanding. Tongues should have understanding. Without understanding, it's not of God. God wants you to preach the gospel. Look, he also says, I will sing with the Spirit, and I will sing with the understanding also. You know, there are some Baptist churches that are all about tent revivals. They may not speak in tongues, but they don't sing with the understanding either. Right? They sing in emotionalism and pro. Oh, and it's like, that's not singing with understanding. When we sing the hymns, you see the words, you know what it says, you know what it means, it helps you grow as a Christian. It, it brings doctrine into your mind. Yeah. And these, this tune can come back to you, teaching each, one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Yeah. Why do we sing with understanding? Because we're supposed to teach doctrine through our music. Yeah. All the other music is the song of fools or the song of drunks. Don't listen to that junk. They're bringing the song of fools into these fake churches and it's just an emotional mess. Look at verse 16. Else when thou shalt bless with the Spirit, 
How shall he that occupieth the room of the unlearned say amen? At thy giving of thanks, seeing he understandeth not what thou sayest. If I ask Brother Alberto to stand and, and pray, and he prays in Spanish, I will not say amen. I refuse to say amen because amen means I agree. Now if he says it in English, I'm going to say amen because what he says I'll probably agree with. You understand the difference? Look at verse 18. I thank my God. I speak with tongues more than you all. Yet in the church, I had rather speak five words with my understanding that by my voice I might teach others also than 10,000 words in an unknown tongue. If the Pentecostal or Charismatic churches were, were really saved, they really had the Holy Spirit, they were honest about the Scriptures, they would look at that and say, yeah, what's been happening doesn't really help anybody. It's just a big, everybody's just showing off. It's a circus that's not of God. Look at verse 24. But if all prophesy, right, if all preach, think about this. Somebody walks in, and here's our church, we all preach. Everybody in here, I mean, for the most part, is a soul winner. You take part, your family's soul winner. And you're, hey, I might just be a silent partner, but I'm going out. I'm going to learn it. I'm going to do it. I want to be a preacher too, right? And that's what this is talking about. If all prophesy, verse 24, and there come in one that believeth not, or one unlearned, he is convinced of all, he is judged of all. It doesn't require an additional language. An English speaker that is unlearned, that doesn't know doctrine, maybe they're saved, they come in. Hey, before the service, I had to break it up. Every time, there's guys talking about the Bible everywhere you turn in this church. Isn't that cool? I love it. What are you oh, talking about the Bible again? Come on, guys. Listen, that's the way it ought to be. He's convinced of all, he's judged of all. If somebody comes in with a question about doctrine, it's not up to one man, it's up to the Bible. And when all the men prophesy, when they all preach, when the women know their Bible, he's conv they're convinced of all. They're judged of all. It says if somebody that uh, doesn't believe comes to this church, our goal in this church is to have somebody preach the Gospel to them. It happens every week. Somebody shows up, we try to make sure they're saved. It happens to our visitors. I'm going to make sure that you're saved. Because you're, I don't want your blood on my hands. That's my job to tell you the Gospel. And that's what it's talking about. That was the purpose of tongues in the church. Look at verse 27, it said, If any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two, or at the most by three, and that by course, and let one interpret. By course means, if we had, uh, let's see, what languages do you speak, brother? You were telling me the other day. Portuguese, right? So if he's, okay, he's going to come up. We got two or three. We got Spanish. We got Portuguese. We've got some Aramaic back there. We're going to let all three preach. We're going to do it by course. One will come up and preach. One will interpret so we all understand or edified. The next guy sits down. Then Spanish gets up and preaches and interprets. Then Spanish sits down. Aramaic gets up and preaches and interprets. Do you understand what's happening here? So in, they will well, see everybody was doing it at the same time. No. Has anybody ever been in a Pentecostal church where you've got like 100 people talking at the same time? True story. Crazy. <laughs> Yeah, if you don't believe that people are possessed by devils, just slip in one of these places one Sunday afternoon. Just slip in there and watch them just woo! Watch the ladies just running around, waving flags. Oh, bah, 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 bah. You're like, what in the world? This isn't church. This isn't of God. Listen, this is what's happening in these places. And when you run out across somebody that's, that, that's a Pentecostal, you need to know these things. You need to know what doctrine they believe because they may, oh, I believe in Jesus. Oh yeah, faith alone. What else? What else? Do you have to have tongues? Of course. Do you have to have a changed life? Well, of course. Who was it? Brother Graham was it earlier? It was just saying you talk to a Pentecostal at the door today and the lady, no, we believe the same thing. No, no, no. And then finally it's, wait, are you telling me you can just believe on Jesus and smoke and drink and live however you want? Well, yeah. That's what the Bible says. Oh, I can't. Of course you can't believe it because you're not saved. You're believing in yourself. You're trusting in yourself. There's a division. Pentecostals are not Christian. Look at verse 32. The Bible's clear here. He makes everything in order. It says, And the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, 
as in all the churches of the saints, right? If you go into one of these places, it's total confusion. Yep. Look, he says, let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as saith the law. And if they will learn anything, let them, all, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for women to speak in the church. Pentecostal churches are full of women just running their mouth the whole time, and they can do whatever they want. Hey, there's probably a woman on the stage leading the whole circus. Yeah. Look, what? Came the Word of God out from you? Or came it unto you only? What do you, what, we, well, we do it different over here. Why? What do you think? You have the, the Word of God came from you, woman? Right? You think you, church, you're going to do something different? Pentecostals? What? You have the Word of God. It originated from you because that's the way they act. Well, of course, it originated with us on the Isuzu Street Possession. Right? They try to pin back and say, we started something nobody else has. Yeah, I know. It's called heresy. Yeah. It's called lying. It's called deception. Right. Look, he says, if any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. You need to acknowledge Pentecostals, Charismatics, that what God says here is one at a time, it has to be a real language. You can't just make it up as you go. Somebody has to interpret. And if there's no interpreter, then shut up in the church. Don't even open your mouth. It's not profitable. Last verse from the chapter, let all things be done decently and in order. Let all things be done decently and in order. Turn to Acts chapter 18. The charismatic or the, the crazy maniac movement, as I like to call it, right, is full of a bunch of crazy emotional women and you know again I, I do believe they're filled with devils and I am not blaspheming the Holy Spirit what they are doing is not of God's Holy Spirit it's something they're making up they're copying people that are liars that are deceivers that wanted people's money and they're trying to judge themselves amongst themselves by saying look I am more spiritual than you watch what I can do right and they're all just trying to show off and they're making it up as they go the next part we're going to talk about is what is the baptism of the Holy Spirit there's, there's two aspects here that, you know, and, and they cannot discern or divide this at all. They cannot see through this at all, but, you know, mostly because they're not saved, right? It's spiritually discerned. Once you're saved, you can understand it. And listen, they don't believe in once saved, always saved. So they don't believe they have a permanent indwelling of the Holy Spirit. They do not believe that we're all baptized into one body, as it says. They don't believe that they have the same Holy Spirit that we do always living inside of us. They think they have to go back down to the altar and have another experience, you know, and, and get it again. Oh, I lost it, so I'm coming back for it, right? Or how do you go, ooh, 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 you know, th th so they're trying to like renew it constantly because they don't have a hold of it. And, you know, the Bible teaches that once you're saved, once you've believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, your spirit is sealed, Right? we're all saved in here we are all spirit sealed when your body dies no matter whether you die in sin or in a righteous way your spirit is sealed your spirit will go to heaven that's the beautiful promise that God has given us the free gift of eternal life it lasts forever and they don't understand that in the Old Testament of King Saul it says in the spirit of the Lord will come upon thee and thou shalt prophesy with them and shall be turned into another man now listen, in the Old Testament, they did not have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit as we do today. But back then, King Saul, it was told, God's Spirit will fall on you, He'll come upon you, and you're going to preach. King Saul's probably thinking, I'm not a preacher. right? He wasn't even a king at this time. He, he was a, probably a humble man, but he was a man of God. He was saved eternally. He was still eternally secure without the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And he was filled to preach. And it goes on, it says, And it was so that when he had turned his back to go from Samuel... God gave him another heart. And all those signs came to pass that day. And when they came thither to the hill, behold, a company of prophets met him, and the Spirit of God came upon him, and he prophesied among them. Here's little old Saul, not a preacher, not a king. He meets up the other preacher. God fills him. God's, God's Spirit falls upon him. He begins to preach to them. And it came to pass when all that knew him before time saw that, behold, he prophesied among the prophets. Then the people said one to another, What is this that has come unto the son of Kish? Is Saul also among the prophets? And listen, that's what happens when you get saved. First, your soul is secure. You have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. But then you have the power of God to go out and preach boldly. Yeah. And when your friends that knew you before see it, they're going to say, Whoa, something has changed. 
And listen, if you say, well, nothing's ever changed with me, you might not be saved. And listen, I'm not saying works are evidence of salvation, but if in your heart of hearts you say, I don't know that I have the Holy Spirit, then I would challenge, what are you trusting in for salvation? You have to understand this. Look, in, in Psalm 51, the same thing of David. When David sinned, he, he was petitioned to the Lord. He says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from Thy presence, and take not Thy Holy Spirit from me. David, who was already a man of God, a king and a preacher, said, Lord, please don't take the filling of Your Holy Spirit. Lord, You have fell on me and I have prophesied for You before. Please don't take this from me. I've messed up in the flesh. Don't take me that gift that You've given to me. He says, Restore unto me the joy of Thy salvation and uphold me with Thy free spirit. So you have to understand the filling of the Spirit or when the Spirit comes upon somebody is so that they will preach, they will prophesy boldly. You're in Acts chapter 18. Look at verse 24. And a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the Scriptures, came to Ephesus. Right? So this guy, he knows the Bible. He knows his Scriptures. He was born religiously as a Jew. He was born in Alexandria, and then he's going to Ephesus, different areas, different languages. And this man, it says, verse 25, this man was instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in the Spirit, he spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John. So this guy doesn't have the complete picture, right? It might be said, maybe he was saved as a Jew, or maybe he was a follower of God, God's people under the Jew, but at this time, salvation was through Jesus Christ. The new covenant came in. He had to do away with the old. So this guy had to have that information as well. But he only knew the baptism of John, it says. Verse 26, And he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, whom when Aquila and Priscilla had heard, they took him under them and expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. And he was disposed to come to pass at Achai, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him, who when he was come helped them much which had believed through grace. So I believe this guy is kind of a, a gray area, and you know, I don't really want to be pinned down on this, but I believe maybe he was saved under the old covenant, if you will. But as far as now that Jesus had finished the new covenant, he had to be saved under the new covenant. I believe it's possible under the old covenant as a man that was exercising holiness and seeking God, that God's Spirit had came on him and he prophesied boldly in the past, but he still had to be saved under the new covenant. Things were changing as this was being written. Look at, look at the next chapter, uh, 19. Look at verse number 1. And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus, and finding certain disciples, he said unto them, Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. Now listen, according to the New Covenant, this guy was not saved. But it says he was following the Lord. It says he was doing things for the Lord. Yeah, probably under the Old Covenant. He had a zeal for God, but not the knowledge he needed to be saved at the time where he was. And look what it says in verse 3. And he said unto them, Unto then what were you baptized? And he said, Unto John's baptism. Now so he's saying, But no, I, I have John's baptism. I, was, I, went, I met John. I got baptized by John. He says, Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on Him which should come after Him, that is, on Christ Jesus. He made it very clear. You say you were baptized, but you have not put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. You're not saved. If you were saved, you would have the Holy Ghost right now. So he preaches this to him. He teaches him what he's lacking, what he's, the information he's missing to be a Christian. Verse 5, it says, When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. So, they hear the preaching. They believe it. God's Spirit comes inside of his heart. He's eternally secure. And he now has the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And now also, he has the power of the Spirit to fall on his life so he can preach in other languages. A miracle of the Holy Spirit. You can't put one before the other. And you think about how most Pentecostals would say, well, I, I, I don't believe I can keep my salvation. I believe I can lose my salvation. But I speak in tongues. 
okay, so you spoke on tongues on Saturday, but on Friday you thought you weren't saved. So as an unsaved person, you're using God's Holy Spirit to speak in tongues. Seems rather confusing, yeah. right? This guy, once he got saved, once he was sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, then he spoke in another language because he was in, you know, they're in areas where there's different languages. Then he preached the gospel mightily. What did he preach? The same thing, the Lord Jesus Christ. Turn and believe on Jesus. Stop believing the old covenant. You must believe in the new way. Move to Luke chapter, well actually verse, look at verse 8 here. It says, And he went into the synagogue and spake boldly for the space of three months, disputing and persuading the things concerning the kingdom of God. Spake boldly for three months. Hey, that's a Christian. Look at it. Disputing, persuading. He's convincing people what God has done. Turn to Luke chapter 3. So he was saved and sealed with the Holy Spirit. Then he was feel, filled with the Holy Spirit and he preached boldly. It didn't happen the other way around and, and it couldn't happen the other way. The way the Pentecostals and Charismatics teach it, it just shows a lack of understanding, really a lack of spiritual discernment. Now Jesus talked about the baptism of the Holy Spirit in all the Gospels. In every one of them. In Matthew 3, He says, I indeed baptize you with water. This is John speaking. With water unto repentance, which we just heard about. That's to believe on Christ. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Now what does it mean to be baptized with fire? What happened at the day of Pentecost? Right? They had fire on them. The Spirit fell upon them. It was evident by, this, by a fire that was on them. But also fire is symbolic of judgment. Right? You, when something is purged or passes through the fire, it's, it's tested. And in the next verse he says, "...whose fan is in his hand, and he will throughly purge his floor, and gather his wheat into the garner, and he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire." So he's teaching that you'll be that the spirit of prophesying is also of judgment. In Mark chapter 1, verse 8, he says, I indeed have baptized you with water, but he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. You're in Luke chapter 3. Find verse number 16. John answered, saying unto them all, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I cometh, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to unloose. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Several months ago I preached a sermon called The Spirit of Judgment and the Spirit of Burning. Foretelling of what Jesus would come in. Right? A spirit of burning. Hmm, what is that? That's the fire. That's the fire. It's the spiritual thing. It's talking about being about judging things righteously. Look at the next verse. Whose fan is in his hand and he will throughly purge his floor and will gather the wheat into his garner, but the chaff he will burn with fire unquenchable. Now turn to John chapter 1. We're almost done here. John chapter 1. This is the last place in the Gospels that he mentions it. So the Spirit is used through men that are already saved to preach. And when you say that if you don't believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you will go to hell, that is a very judgmental thing. Right, that is fire and brimstone preaching, which Jesus did. It was foretold it would happen. And that's that spirit, that energy, like Jeremiah said, like a fire shut up in my bones. Right, That was God's Spirit falling upon Jeremiah. Now you, as Christians, every one of you in here that's saved, have this same Spirit on tap, if you will. But it's not like you can push a button and make it happen. What has to happen is you have to submit yourself to the will of the Lord. If you say, well, I think I'm just going to keep living as a, an adulterer and as a drunk. I know I'm saved. I won't go to hell because of it. Well, why would God fill you with His Spirit and prophesy boldly through you? Right? Maybe, maybe you'll be caught not being sober. Maybe you're drunken in your mind. When an opportunity shows up, you uh, I didn't know what to say. Yeah, because you're drunk. Yeah. Right? But if you're unprepared, but you have God's Holy Spirit, you're striving for holiness, you're striving to obey God, and, and this happens, on a moment's notice, the Holy Spirit will bring things back to your remembrance whatsoever He has said unto you. Right? Whatever's in the Bible that you've studied out and learned, God's going to bring these things back, and when you're done, you'll be like, man, I don't know where that came from. I said some stuff. I mean, I've got to write that down. That was really good. Right? That's God's Spirit 
working through us as His preachers. Look, John chapter 1, look at verse 31. And I knew Him not, but that He should be made manifest to Israel. Therefore I am come baptizing with water. And John bare record, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode upon Him. And I knew Him not, but He that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on Him, the same is He which baptizeth with the Holy Ghost. And I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. Now turn to Acts chapter 1 as we go back to what happened right before the day of the Pentecost. So this promise has been here all along. We saw it in Joel. We see it in all the Gospels. The promise that God will have preachers preaching mightily. You're in Acts chapter 1. Find verse number 4. Acts 1 verse 4 it says, And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith He, Ye have heard of Me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Understand this. This is saved people. These are disciples. These men knew the Bible. They knew the Lord. They were eternally secure and he's saying, here comes a promise of being baptized with the Holy Spirit. It's them that are going to be filled with the Holy Spirit to preach. Look at the next verse. When they therefore were come together, they asked of Him, saying, Lord, wilt Thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And He said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in His own power, but ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. He says you will be baptized, and then in verse 8, he says the Holy Ghost will come upon you. What does it mean to be baptized? It means you're immersed. Just as Brother Dalton went all the way under the water, can you imagine God's Spirit because you're striving to please Him and, and be a witness for Him? God says, okay, I'm going to give you my Spirit. You're going to be filled with the Spirit. You're going to be on fire. Yeah, people might stand and say, whoa, you're being judgmental. No, I'm filled with the Spirit. Yeah. Look, I'm not going out to pick fights, but I'm going to go out and preach the Gospel boldly and nobody can stop me. Yeah. I'm working for God. I have a mission and it's to let everybody know. He defines it right here in this chapter in chapter 1 to right before chapter 2 when they start speaking in tongues. It's already been defined in context. Go to chapter 11. This is the last place we're going to go. Acts chapter 11. He defines it yet again that this filling of the Spirit, when the Spirit comes upon you, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is when you got, like Jeremiah, like a fire shut up in my bones. I want to speak God's Word so much that I just can't stand it. I can't shut up. I can't hold my peace. I can't hold my mouth. Look at Acts 11. Look at verse number 15. He's telling the story here to them. And he says, And as I began to speak, the Holy Ghost fell on them as on us at the beginning. Right? So he's making the connection. He said, What happened in chapter 1 and 2, it happened to the Gentiles as well. Look at verse 16. Then remembered I the word of the Lord, how that he said, John indeed baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost. For as much then as God gave them the like gift as He did unto us who believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, what was I that I could withstand God? He's saying, okay, the Gentiles who traditionally the Jews would say, well, they can't be saved like we have. They don't have the blessings like we have. He's saying, I was there at the beginning in Pentecost when we who were already saved had God's Spirit fall upon us. It was visible. There was fire. We're speaking in new languages. He's saying, just in that same manner, I see these Gentiles who all of a sudden, they put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. They believed. And then they also get the Holy Spirit. Before they're baptized in water, they were baptized by the Holy Spirit. They were preaching mightily. They believed it and they got on fire. They, yeah, the Spirit was in them and it was evident. Look at the next verse. When they heard these things, they held their peace and glorified God, saying, then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. 
What a beautiful thing. And that he's making it full circle. So every time it was foretold that he would baptize with the Spirit, it's not what happens at the Pentecostal church on Sunday. That's just evident. That's when the Holy Spirit fills you up and you start talking. Listen, Brother Dalton got baptized in water this morning, but when he spoke of God through the Spirit of God, before that water baptism, that's the Holy Spirit working through him. Giving him boldness. Giving him the strength and the wisdom and the knowledge that he needs. That's what the baptism of the Holy Spirit is. That's why God, God gave us tongues for preaching. God gave us the baptism of the Holy Spirit today for every believer to be filled with the Spirit that God's Spirit might come upon you. You'd be immersed with it so boldly you will speak the truth about Jesus Christ. That He is Son of God. That He's our Savior. Look, all believers are indwelled with the Holy Spirit, but not all are walking in the Spirit. Not all are filled with the Spirit. But if you want to be filled with the Spirit, it's up to you. What do you have to do? Obey God's Word. Listen to what He's saying. Walk with God and He will walk with you. And then He'll speak mightily through you. Let's pray. Lord God, thank You for Your Word. Lord, thank You for the mysterious things and the easy to be understood things. Lord, we know that certain things are twisted by false prophets and cults out there. Lord, and I pray that You would give us the wisdom to withstand them. Lord, I pray that You would help this church to grow mightily in the Spirit. I pray that You would baptize us in Your Holy Spirit so that we would be filled with Your Spirit and preach the Gospel and get many saved. Lord, we love You. We thank You for the gift of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Lord, we thank You for the gift of free salvation that came through Your Son, Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray that You would bless our time together after the service tonight. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. In closing, let's take our hymnals and...